Uh, so what I'd like to do is just spend a couple minutes uh, talking a little bit about what I do, and then we'll ask the other speakers just to give their two cents before we get in on the questions. The majority of the patients that I see are individuals with advanced or metastatic kidney cancer. And the patients that we see are quite varied. Um, they all have different situations. Uh, the various features that we look at an individual and their cancer to help guide us in their therapy. So we look at the cancer, what type of kidney cancer they have, where is their metastases, the number of sites that are involved, when was the kidney cancer originally diagnosed, what sort of blood work, um, what do the blood work results show, how fit is the individual, what other medical conditions they have, and obviously what is the patient's wishes. And that consists of a very heterogeneous group of individuals, uh, and the treatment is very different for each person. And so that's why it is important when looking at management of patients with metastatic or advanced renal cell carcinoma, it really is a multidisciplinary uh, team approach. So behind each patient and their family, we hope that there's a team of healthcare professionals, not only physicians like ourselves, but also we have other healthcare professionals like pharmacists, nurses that help with drug management and toxicity. Also, drug reimbursement coordinators are very important because access to therapies is an issue. Uh, pathologists and radiologists. So at our cancer center, as many cancer centers across Canada, we have multidisciplinary rounds where we talk about challenging cases or individuals who are in difficult situations, and we try to work together to come up with a best plan or approach for those individuals. So one of the things that's really revolutionized kidney cancer is a better understanding of what is going on with the basic biology of the disease in the laboratory. And this has led to the development of multiple new therapies for kidney cancer. When we look about, back about 15 years when I was a resident, the management of kidney cancer was very limited. We had very little to offer patients. Um, but that has changed significantly in the last 15 years. This in part is due, as I mentioned, to a better understanding of the pathways that make the kidney cancer cells grow. And with research and development and pharma, pharma input, uh, there's been development of therapies that shut off the signals that tell the cancer cells to grow, what we call cell-targeted treatments. The traditional treatments that we use for other types of cancers, like breast cancer and colon cancer, chemotherapy does not work well on these types of agents. And what's been very exciting recently is looking at a new class of agents called drugs to immunotherapies, drug to enhance the immune system to work better and recognize the cancer. And particularly of interest, in the last year or so, there's been some new combinations of therapies that look very promising. So one of them is uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab. Those are two types of immunotherapies that combined uh, help the individual's immune system better recognize the cancer. And our usual standard of care for metastatic kidney cancer is sutent or bisoponib, which are cell-targeted agents. And so there's been a recent study that's been uh, published where they compared these two therapies to each other. And what they found is for individuals who had more advanced disease, what we call intermediate or poor prognosis disease, that these patients did better in general on the immune therapy. Patients are living longer, had better responses, and ultimately, despite the side effects of these immune therapies, had better quality of life. And there are even some patients that have what we call complete responses. As opposed to SUTENT, the patients who had more slow growing or favorable disease, they actually did better with the regular standard of care. So based with this information, we have a bit of an algorithm that we use in terms of managing patients with kidney cancer to try to help us make decisions about what is the best treatment for an individual. And so we do categorize people and their cancers into different prognostic groups to help guide us. So it stands right now, Sutent and Pazopinib, which are both cell-targeted agents, are our first lines of treatment. And if those are no longer working, then there are other therapies that have activity, which are primarily cell-targeted treatments like excitinib, cabozantinib, and a combination of everlimus and levatinib are quite good, and also the immune therapy uh, nivolumab. Now with this most recent study for patients with intermediate or poor prognosis, more aggressive disease, ideally we'd like to give these patients ipilimumab and nivolumab uh, if we have access to it, which is an issue I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, these therapies have toxicity uh, and are not working in everybody and not everybody's eligible, so in those individuals, sutent or bisoponib may be considered. And another little plug that I just wanted to put in is that uh, all across the world, but here in Canada, we try very much to try to find out what's the best treatment for an individual, and so we're very involved in clinical trials. 
Um, but I'd also like to thank you, uh, the patients and the families, for participating in these clinical trials because this information really helps to guide us for the future as to what's the best treatment for all individuals as we uh, advance the care for this disease. So finally, drug access is an issue. Canada is a big country. We have many provinces and territories, and each one has their own health authority. And one of the big challenges is drug access, because despite someone living in Canada, their access to certain therapies is quite variable. A treatment that you may be able to get in British Columbia may not be accessible in PEI, for example. And some of the great work that Kidney Cancer Canada is doing is trying to help all patients with kidney cancer get some equitable access to these drug therapies. So where are we at right now? Well, the good news is that over the past 10 years has been dramatic improvements in overall survival. We're learning better how to manage side effects and optimize efficacy and helping people have better quality of life. And we're continuing to make advancements in research. However, there's great room for improvement. We still don't know exactly how to pick the best treatment for everybody. Um, we wish we had some way of figuring out which drugs are going to work better in which individuals. We have little information about how to treat the less common or non-clear cell histologies of kidney cancer. And equitable care and drug access is a problem in Canada, and so that's something that we want to improve. So that's my little spiel, and we're going to move on to our other uh, experts just to give the, their little two cents as a little snapshot of what's going on with their disease sites. I'll, uh, I'll speak to um, what's happening in surgery for kidney cancer. Uh, where uh, we have, uh, a, a, if anybody comes with uh, a mass in their kidney, what we recommend first is that you try and um, have that removed. That's your best uh, option for cure. Um, and uh, we have lots of techniques to do a, what's called a partial nephrectomy. We want to try and uh, spare the normal part of the kidney and just take out just the tumor. Um, in just about 10, 15 years ago, the standard was what's called a radical nephrectomy, remove the entire uh, kidney and um, leave the spare kidney, and, uh, and most times that works out really well, but if somebody has diabetes or high blood pressure, sometimes that one kidney may not have good function uh, to get some of these therapies that we talked about right now with Christina. So uh, we try and do a partial nephrectomy uh, because the, we have lots of data showing that doing a partial nephrectomy and just taking out just a tumor and saving the normal portion of the kidney is as good a cure rate as a radical nephrectomy. We have some patients that come forth and say, uh, you know what, just take everything out, I just want to be safe. And uh, we, can, we can quote lots of data and lots of experience around the world now that taking out just the tumor and saving the normal portion of the kidney uh, is as good a cure rate, if not better, than, um, uh, than taking out the entire kidney. Um, sometimes it's not possible, sometimes we have to take out the entire kidney if the tumor is very central or too large, but uh, that's where uh, it's important to uh, talk to your urologist or your surgeon about the possibility of a partial nephrectomy. And if you're not satisfied, get a second opinion. I get emails from across the country about patients that uh, are asking about, you know, is this tumor amenable to a partial nephrectomy? And I think it's important, it's hard to, for me to do that by email, but uh, I, think I encourage a second opinion uh, to get to see if a partial nephrectomy is possible. I guess other innovations, we're now all looking at robotic surgery. Uh, many of the academic centers have robots. And robots, I'll, at the end of the uh, uh, day, I'm going to talk about some of this robotic surgery and show some um, uh, videos and some pictures, so uh, hopefully that'll be interesting for you about how we do robotic surgery. And using the robot gives us a bit more range of motion uh, to uh, remove complex tumors and save the kidney. So robotic technology is now here in Canada, uh, and uh, many of the academic centers have it, uh, and uh, that's a good option for, your, uh, for surgery as well. Uh, now, if some tumors are not amenable to uh, surgery, then we have radiation options as well, and we'll hear about that in a few minutes. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm happy to take uh, any questions about, uh, about that. I guess the other thing that comes to mind is sometimes now we're doing uh, neoadjuvant therapy uh, or some of these drugs that we have here, uh, giving them before surgery to try and shrink down the tumor to make it more possible. So I, that's one of my areas of, uh, of uh, research and expertise in, in Hamilton where I give a lot, a lot of, I see a lot of complex uh, patients with, uh, well, the patients aren't complex, their tumors are complex, where they have uh, these uh, tumors in both their kidneys or tumors that are very central and they're at risk for dialysis, where we can give some of these uh, systemic therapies to shrink down the tumor and do surgery. So it's really a plug for that multidisciplinary team where we work with our medical oncologist, the urologist, and the radiation oncologist. I noticed a picture had the, uh, the medical oncologist in the front, really the urologist would be in the front, and then everybody behind them. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on then. Thanks a All lot, right, Neil. Okay. William? <laughs> thanks very much, Christina. 
so in 20, 2018, I just uh, want to highlight the fact that radiation treatment and stereotactic radiation treatment uh, is a very exciting time uh, in terms of this treatment technique uh, in, in the 21st century. Uh, next slide, two slides actually. So most of the uh, people in the room do understand what SBRT is and it stands for stereotactic body radiotherapy or defined as stereotactic ablative radiation treatment. And essentially it's the precise sculpted delivery of high dose focal radiation to a specific target or tumor target and typically three to five treatments that last over seven to ten days. And really that high dose to target allows us to focus the radiation treatment just to the tumor site leading to steep dose gradients, meaning the amount of radiation beyond the tumor within millimeters falls to very, very minimal amounts. And at Sunnybrook and across the world, in North America, Canada, and the world, a lot of that stereotactic experience has been built on our ability to deliver treatment to the brain and at our institution, built on our backbone treatments on spine itself, lung treatment, and liver metastases as well. Next slide, Next slide please. So, as a brief summary, Historically, renal cell carcinomas have been felt to be radiation resistance, meaning the old way or conventional way where we used to deliver radiation treatments with either a front, front shot, two shots to the side or shot to the back, really didn't lead uh, much to a response or ability to control the tumor at a cost of high price of side effects and toxicity because the radiation not only hit the tumor, but it also caused collateral damage to the adjacent normal tissues and organs. But we did know that when we gave higher doses of radiation and just five shots for mainly for palliation of symptoms for pain or bleeding is that in fact it did work interestingly next slide based on experimental data both in animal models and based on clinical data we know that when we're able to deliver high doses of radiation treatment particular to the brain and the spine is that those lesions essentially melted away leading to control of the tumor over a number of years well into the 80 and 90 percent of two to three years down the road so, in 2018 and the 21st century, what's exciting is that our ability to utilize the advances in technology of our ability to focus the radiation down allows us now to overcome the so-called perceived notion that renal cell carcinomas were radiation resistance. We're now able to sculpt that radiation dose and essentially blast the melt away of those tumors. The advantages of SBRT is that it's non-invasive therapy, it's outpatient treatment, we're not limited, to where, limited by the size of the tumor, where it's located, particularly for primary tumors in the kidney itself or in metastatic sites. And it's well tolerated based on the studies that we have to date. And overall, those three to five fractions of radiation treatment, those three to five shots is relatively inexpensive. So two clinical scenarios moving forward in the future for radiation oncology are for those patients that Neil had alluded to, was for patients who have medically inoperable tumors, either due to patient, primarily due to patient factors. And what better way to illustrate that is with the clinical case. This is one of the very first patients that we had in our series at Sunnybrook. She was a very sweet lady from up north. Unfortunately, she had multiple medical comorbidities with a rapidly enlarging left side of renal tumor, and she was on the verge of receiving renal replacement therapy because she had chronic renal failure baseline creatinine was well over 250, and actually by the time I met her, it was well over 300. She was not able to have any focal ablative therapies with her. They tried actually to coil and embolize it, but the tumor continued to grow. She was not an operative candidate because she actually had a cold blue during the procedure for the embolization itself. They could not put, uh, they could not intubate her. So ultimately, by the time she met me, her tumor was close to six centimeters in size, and we were offered her stereotactic radiotherapy. What is stereotactic radiation treatment? Essentially what you're looking at here, it's maybe difficult to see, is that the high dose treatment is the red line covering the tumor, the red color wash area, and the green is the safety margin that we treat around it. And as you can see, the radiation beyond that, based on the lines, is completely at a very, very low level, well beyond allowing us to protect and save the remainder of the renal cortex, renal parenchyma. This is just an illustrative example that not only can we treat relatively small tumors, but we're not limited by size. This is one of the largest ones we have in our series, is about 18 centimeters in total size. This is just to highlight that stereotactic radiation treatment for medically inoperable renal tumors 
has been looked at internationally. There are only 10 centers of excellence worldwide that have looked at this. Sunnybrook and the Juravinsky Cancer Center in Hamilton with Anil and Anand Swaminath are the two leading Canadian centers who participated in this analysis, essentially showing that we have excellent success in controlling primary renal cancers with relatively favorable side effects to the kidney with minimal impact uh, and safety uh, on the adjacent normal tissues as well. This is the clinical trial that we have, Aquos. You can look it up. We'll talk about it more later. Next slide. And the second clinical scenario, as Christina had alluded to, was the multidisciplinary management of patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. This is an example of a 60-year-old gentleman that was initially diagnosed with a clear cell renal cell carcinoma back in 2005, underwent resection of an adrenal metastases, and then four years ago, myself and my other colleagues at Sunnybrook went and delivered stereotactic radiation treatment to three other sites, a lung metastasis, liver metastasis, and multiple, actually three metastases in the pancreas. And we're happy to say four years down the road, there's no evidence of active disease. All right. We'll talk a little bit later about what the future holds in terms of utilizing stereotactic radiation treatment in combination with the new and emerging drug therapies for patients with metastatic disease. And that's the landscape that we're looking at in 2018. So, so for those who don't know what a medical geneticist does, uh, I'm a genetics physician. Um, the majority of kidney cancer is caused, like all cancer is caused by mutations, and you generally accumulate those mutations from obesity, the environment, smoking, diabetes, and being tall. Uh, but a lot of patients are not born with the mutation. So I see patients and families where they are born with an actual mutation. And in breast cancer, the most famous patient is Angelina Jolie. So she has a BRCA1 mutation, and that causes breast and ovarian cancer. There are approximately 12 genes that cause hereditary kidney cancer. And those patients are sent to me, and about 10% or 4, 5 to 10% of all kidney cancer patients uh, do have this. And a lot of kidney cancer patients may be focused on their disease, but other questions they may have is, will I get another cancer? Patients who have and are born with a genetic mutation are at risk of having other cancers also. Their children are at risk of having cancer. So by identifying the gene, we can look in their body to see if they have other types of cancers because we know what cancers they are at risk for. For instance, if you have von Hippel-Lindau disease, you are at risk of having brain tumors, pancreatic cysts, multiple clear cell carcinomas of your kidney. So we examine patients who have von Hippel-Lindau disease very, very carefully by doing brain scans on them every year, spine scans on them every year. All their family members get the same type of personalized treatment for us to detect those cancers early. Um, so a lot of Families may say, well, how do I know if I'm at risk of having a hereditary or a familial form of kidney cancer? Well, if you're born with a genetic mutation, you're probably going to get kidney cancer when you're young. So the general rule is if you're kidney cancer and the more common kidney cancer is clear cell, if you are under 45, you should probably at least have a genetics clinic assessment. If you have any other cancer, so you had kidney cancer and you had breast cancer, or you had kidney cancer and an eye tumor, or your CT scan shows that you have pancreatic cysts. If there are some suspicious features of your kidney cancer, you have kidney cancer plus, that would also be an indication. And if you're, you have a family history of other people who have kidney cancer or other related types of cancers, you should be seen by a genetics clinic. Also, if you have a very rare form of kidney cancer, like papillary, chromophobic, oncocytic, those types of tumors are not very common in the general population. And finally, um, genetic testing is generally done by a blood test. Uh, we take your blood and analyze its genes by looking at the approximately 12 genes associated with kidney cancer. Um, I'm not involved in the treatment of kidney cancer. I'm, mainly involved in the diagnosis, but I have a few families where there's lots of kidney cancers in the generations above. Um, and those uh, patients are mostly worried about their kids and their grandkids. And I'm in the business of curing kidney cancer because if we identify the mutation in the family, then the grandkids can be 
um, counseled, and the mutation can be actually prevented from being transferred to the next generation through a variety of different techniques such as in vitro fertilization and amniocentesis, et cetera. So um, that's where medical genetics uh, fits in. Um, not all of you will see a medical genetics clinic, but some of you will. So um, that's what we do. So uh, I think the uh, genetic piece is really important, and uh, Raymond Kim has one of, been one of our national leaders uh, in um, bringing this to light, the whole genetic screening. And certainly even in my clinic, we treat uh, many, many patients with kidney cancer, and we haven't been able to uh, send a lot of them for genetics, but we're now uh, doing that on a regular basis using Dr. Kim's questionnaires. And, uh, and again, the, the key ones who, have, who haven't been screened in the audience is is anybody who's under the age of 45, of which most of you look like you are under the age of 45, uh, and any patient who um, uh, has papillary uh, or chromophobe, you should uh, talk to your oncologist, whether it be your uro-oncologist or your medical oncologist, about getting genetic screening. Uh, so we're instituting that on a system-wise manner in Hamilton now with the help of Dr. Kim, uh, but we weren't doing that on a regular basis, and I think it's uh, the only place that was really doing that regularly was actually Princess Margaret, the head of the field, but I think we need to uh, roll this out across the country, and uh, we're starting that in Hamilton now on, a, on a, uh, a systematic basis. Yeah, genetic testing is cheap now, so, and quick. One of the barriers is that to see a geneticist uh, takes about a year and a half because they're golfing a lot, uh, but, um, uh, but uh, if you, if you uh, with Dr. Kim as a favor, we'll see them within a few weeks. My name is Jack Ostroff. I have a question regarding therapy and SBRT. Are those trials looking like and, uh, prospects of this successful marriage? Yes, there are active clinical trials right now looking at combined therapy or stereotactic treatment with immunotherapy agents. Uh, these are active clinical trials and early phase studies. To be honest with you, the, the studies are still uh, evolving, so patients still are actively being recruited. Uh, and there's no, as far as I know, early stage reports yet, but in terms of the centers that have had them opened, um, generally well tolerated. However, there's no, there's no definitive report to date, so you're, you're asking a cutting edge question, and that's where we are in 2018, and that's exactly where the future, where the future what the future looks like, is testing these agents in combination with radiation treatment and how it fits in, right? And would you expect to have results? Um, I would probably say to answer what the, the goal of the afternoon session is probably in the next two to three years, right? They're under active investigation as we speak. I think the key thing about what's changing in the field over the last uh, couple of years is that this combination therapy, in the past what we would do is you would have your surgery to remove your kidney, you'd go into drug therapy and you'd just stay on that. What we're doing now is we're reevaluating every time you have a CAT scan to see if there's a possibility for SBRT, a possibility for surgery. Uh, or just carry on with the therapy as long as it's working well. So now uh, it has changed quite a bit over the last number of years where there's lots of options for a combination of radiotherapy for one spot that's growing and the other spots are stable, uh, or surgery if there's a, a lung spot that's growing or a liver spot that's growing and you can you remove that and carry on with the drug therapy. So this multidisciplinary team of all of us here is really what's changed in the last couple of years to, to help uh, um, more success with kidney cancer patients and more, more what we call a club NED, uh, no evidence of disease. So we always want to get into club NED if at all possible. I'd like to know if you have personalized medicine in choosing the chemotherapy. It sounds like maybe you're alive the way you're out. But uh, I, I understand there's some kind of genetic testing that can be used. So that's an excellent question, and that's one thing that we are striving for with the research is can we predict who is going to respond well to certain treatments, because that would be much better for the individual if we could just hone in on the right treatment for them and also decrease toxicity. So at this time, we don't really have any great molecular markers. I mean, the one thing that we look at is this idea of categorizing the disease into these different prognostic categories. And the things that we look at are simple things, like how fit is the patient. Uh, we look at their blood test to see is their calcium elevated? Is there hemoglobin? That's the red stuff that carries oxygen low. Are there signs of inflammation in terms of their neutrophils and platelet counts being elevated? So that's providing us with some guidance. Um, in terms of 
the field of immunotherapy, there's uh, been uh, data looking at certain molecular markers on the surface of the tumor inflammatory cells, what we call uh, PD-1 or PDL one markers. And uh, there's been data looking at to see if that can help to predict which patients are better at responding to immunotherapy. And there's some promising data there. The only issue is that that doesn't show the whole story. And so we're reticent to give only patients with certain markers the treatment because we found that even people that don't have these markers can respond. So that's something that we strive for. And I'm hoping that as we do more uh, correlative studies and research um, looking at uh, what's going on uh, at the surface of the cells uh, with these clinical trials that will get more information. Some uh, hereditary cancer patients, um, particularly in kidney cancer, the ones who have VHL mutations, there is a new drug that is coming out, but you do have to have a hereditary cause of your kidney cancer, and hereditary patients usually are like the test bed to try out these precision cancer medicines. So there's a a drug called a HIF-1-alpha inhibitor um, that is being used in uh, patients who have renal lesions and have a, have a germline or a, a VHL mutation. Um, but that's a very small subset of patients. Eventually, I believe that those types of therapies will be rolled out into um, non-hereditary kidney cancers that have also a VHL change. But uh, that's certainly coming down um, the pipe, and I expect something within five years or so. My question is for Dr. Chu. Um, regarding uh, SBRT for um, metastases, um, I'm interested. I've had several lung metastases, and I've chosen to, to have VATS surgeries. Um, but certainly the SBRT is interesting um, and prob possibly easier to, <laughs> to go through than uh, all the VATS that I've had so far. Um, so I'm curious as, as to size. The key is to get you to Club Net or NED, and it's not necessarily SBRT. Um, ultimately, the whole the, the, the notion, the umbrella term is metastectomy, is the ability to ablate and get rid of the metastases and whatever is the potentially most effective and certainly most the safest way for yourself would be the best. So it's not really in terms of what, uh, what SBRT can do in terms of size because Ultimately, what we're looking for before we make a decision to treat is that we know there's been serial growth or change in a particular spot. Uh, the SBRT, say for the lung, used to be limited to just the peripheral areas within the lung because there's no collateral damage, no, no vital structures, such as if we're treating somewhere close to the chest or what we call the mediastinum. But these days, our ability to sculpt out the radiation really kind of, it's really not too much of an issue now. So I think more importantly, it's not so much the size but it's also important to the location, but also your, your, yours or a patient's ability to tolerate the treatment. And then in terms of the discussion with yourself and the rest of the team as to what the potential best approach would in fact be, right? There's no wrong way or right way, um, but I think it's probably what's most suited for you or really the whole notion of truly personalized medicine and how to take care of metastases is probably the best way to go. So this, this is why it's important to have um, uh, the multidis multidisciplinary approach, but I, I would say in general, and I think this is changing with uh, this new re great new research that uh, the radiation oncologists are doing, in general though, surgery is better than radiation because it's gone. All right, so if you're able to have surgery you can, to remove it, that's, uh, that metastatectomy is actually uh, probably better than having radiation because it may reoccur. And if you biopsy some of these post-radiation lesions, it can be a viable tumor. And this also goes to the option of RFA. So radiation is, as you know, radiation waves to the, to, the, to the tumor, but there's also this technology of radiofrequency ablation. And so it's important to differentiate those. RFA is where you actually put a probe in and you burn it off, where you put heat in there. And there's cryoablation, which is where you put a probe in and you freeze it off. And so even those, which are very good technologies and work well for smaller masses, less than four centimeters, some of those, if you biopsy them after a successful burn, there can still be a viable tumor because the mass is still there. So in general, I would say, my, and I, I'm biased because I am a, a surgeon, but uh, the, the literature <laughs> does suggest this as well, is that uh, removal is, is probably the best option, but it's invasive. So having pieces of your lung and removed is not easy surgery. So that's where we, we have to make a decision uh, as a group about whether this is better to have radiation because of location, because of size, uh, or, or uh, whether surgery is better. 
in, in, there's a protocol that the radiation oncologists have or the interventional radiologists have now where we can do RFA for up to four metastases in the lung that are less than three centimeters. So that's a, a good option because I think if you can put heat to that area and burn it off, that's, that's a very good technology and the results are very promising, but it's still only 10 years old, which is baby steps in the scheme of things. I was just wondering, uh, when is it appropriate to advise a patient uh, when they are diagnosed with kidney cancer uh, to, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> to tell their sons and daughters to get an ultrasound or to be aware? Is it, is it right in just that one case scenario um, to just come out and say, well, you know, your family perhaps should be screened. So unlike breast cancer and colon cancer, there's no evidence that uh, kidney cancer uh, screening without an identified mutation um, is effective. So if, if looking at these families, you, there are very few families that have a lot of kidney cancer in them without a mutation. So um, you yourself, if you had kidney cancer and, uh, and, and underwent genetic testing and don't have a mutation, we generally say that your kids and your first degree relatives, like your parents and your siblings, shouldn't get screened. Um, but if you do have an identified mutation, then the family should get screened. But on a population basis, it's not like um, breast cancer where we would suggest mammograms on a population basis. And even with a strong family history of breast cancer, we would add an MRI to that also. Um, we find the ultrasounds are not uh, very effective at, at detecting it. So without a genetic diagnosis, we generally don't. But uh, sh sharing your, your, your diagnosis with your children um, is important. Uh, because the, they can take lifestyle modifications regardless, even though it's not a familial form of kidney cancer. They, they may want to decrease their risk by not smoking and exercising and trying not to be tall and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so if you have a rare form and you are quite young and you're generally for the common clear cells, we say under 45 is young. Um, or if you have multifocal, um, um, so if you have a tumor on one side and you have another tumor growing on the other side, you should probably get tested for von Hippel-Lindau. Um, so, and if you have one of the rarer forms like chromophobic and papillary, uh, then you should have testing. So you look pretty young. If you had kidney cancer, I'd probably do genetic testing on you. Yeah, the reason I asked, my grandfather had kidney cancer around 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, he had a radical nephrectomy, and mm -hmm. he's still with us today. Um, my father, however, um, got diagnosed at 56, and it was already metastatic. So uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 2015. So. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I kind of advocate for those, even in my community or my province, and I tell them, oh my So is your, is your grandfather still living? He is. And he had kidney cancer? He did. So he's the one who needs genetic testing now. Okay. Because he's the one, is he your dad's dad? Yes. Then he definitely needs genetic testing now, and he should see me. Or, or a geneticist in, their, in your city. Yeah. Yeah. I have to find out how to do that, but thank you. Yes, I wanted to speak to you about uh, statistics, because if you go on the website for a life expectancy, it's very disconcerting. That being said, we were given to understand that they're lumping together everyone, which means an elderly person with advanced disease, is his results are going in with a younger person with slow growth disease. So why isn't it separated out so that you're comparing people with similar um, medical history as opposed to lumping everyone together. So just to clarify, are these patients with just localized kidney cancer that you're asking about or patients I'm with not advanced about mistakes? If you go on the website for the um, kidney cancer and, and you're seeing the life expectancy, it's just giving you a number, but it's based on everyone. So I'm saying it's not being separated out based on age, based on uh, male or female, based on slow growth or advanced, it's just everybody together. So what I'm asking is, why isn't it being separated out to give you the results 
based on somebody in your similar circumstances. We do stratify according to uh, age and, um, um, and other risk factors. And so what Dr. Connell talked about at the beginning about your blood work and the performance status, that we use those to help guide our decision making. So not, ev not everybody is, uh, uh, is grouped together. Uh, everybody's certainly very different in terms of their pathology type, their, um, their, their age, their, the grade of the tumor. Uh, so those numbers shouldn't be the same for everybody, for sure. If I was newly diagnosed and my GP said you have kidney cancer, how do they know how to navigate the system to get to the right, right individual? So we have the four of you here, we have a multidisciplinary team. When your GP sees you first for blood in the urine or some pain and you get an ultrasound showing a spot in your kidney, and then the referral is usually to the urologist, and that's kind of its standard um, uh, around the world uh, because the urologist would talk to you about staging first, and the first step would be staging to see where the cancer is and whether it's spread or not spread. So when you see your urologist with a mass of the kidney that's found by either symptoms or no symptoms, you get a CT scan, which is mandatory, a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis and a chest X-ray or a CT of the chest, and to see if it's spread or not spread. If it's not spread, then usually you don't see a medical oncologist right away. You would see just the urologist who would talk about surgery. And then it goes to which surgeon should you see, and should you see the surgeon that you've been referred to by your family doctor, because the family doctor doesn't know, in general, who the best surgeons are or the best urologists are. They really just have a referral pattern. So they send somebody who has um, uh, urinary tract infection versus prostate problems versus a kidney cancer to the same urologist. So they, that same urologist sees all these disease types. Then it's, it behooves the family doctor and the urologist to say, this is something that I can handle or I can't handle. And then that's up to the patient as well, which is where KCC is critical, to get a second opinion if you're not comfortable. If you're comfortable with your urologist and you say, okay, this makes sense and I've researched them and I understand that this is the way to go, then, then stay with that urologist. And if it's non-metastatic, without spread, you would stay with that doctor. He would take out your uh, tumor or the, do a partial infarctomy or whatever is appropriate. And then he would follow you afterwards for the perpetuity of your disease as long as it doesn't spread. If it's spread, the standard of care in Canada is that you see a medical oncologist and the medical oncologist or the multidisciplinary team at the cancer center, your local cancer center, to talk about the systemic therapy options. And that's where you had a, a team approach of everybody uh, to discuss options. Does that, answer, does that help or? That's the yeah, does that help here. everybody? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, thank you, Anil. Is anybody going to start talking about <clears throat> patient attitude or approach to the disease? I'm not saying today, I'm talking about in general. Um, Dr. Kapoor, you've watched me. <clears throat> I'm, <clears throat> I marched right in. And I, we're like, we're ready to rock and roll, get this shit out of me. And it's a team effort. And we, um, uh, I talked to my, my chemo pills, and I, I thanked them. Uh, my, uh, um, my scans are to be celebrated. The, the poor girls there, I'm ready to tip her a fiver to make sure I get good results. But really, like, my CAT scan is, is a big, big deal. All the way, going to get my CAT scan, can't fucking wait. And, and most of them are great. And uh, I believe that a small part of it is because of my attitude that I want this to be gone so badly that I'm doing whatever it takes to, 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 to get it gone. I don't know that that's something you could instill inside people or if you can just sort of let them know that that attitude is there. It's quite possibly a baloney. <laughs> that science is science, no matter how the patient uh, ad addresses it or reacts to it. But I personally believe that my attitude has helped me come this far. because so I've had some great successes with you, with everything I've done. Yeah, I mean, uh, so for people in the audience, uh, Steve Parton is a very prominent member with uh, kidney cancer. He's uh, got a, a blog, I think, and a web page, or a Facebook page, I think, that has more, more hits than I ever have had. Uh, and um, so he's been through the, we've been through the journey together and uh, attitude is huge. He always comes with a positive attitude and I believe it, I've learned a lot from you uh, that positive attitude uh, does make a big difference in, uh, in uh, 
how, uh, how you go through the journey and your response rate. So I applaud you for a great attitude uh, all, all the time and uh, you're an inspiration to all of us. So. Thank you.